Hello folks, Professor Fiore back for part two of our three-part series on the AC current voltage characteristics of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So here in part two we're going to take a look at capacitors. And we're going to look at a circuit essentially the same as what we did for the resistors. We're going to have a uh, nice voltage source over here, capacitor under test, a voltmeter across it, and an ammeter in series with it. And essentially what we want to do is find out what happens as we, various, uh, as we vary various parameters in the circuit, what happens to the current compared to the voltage. Now in the DC case, you know, we treat capacitors in a, a very simple sort of almost digital kind of way. Um, in a DC case, if the capacitor is not charged, then initially we treat it as a short, and then we know that the cap will start to charge, but once we reach steady state, we treat the cap as an open. So we basically think of it as, um, you know, these sort of two states, this initial short and this eventual open, and, you know, some kind of transition between the two. And we understand that the current is equal to the capacitance times the rate of change of voltage across it, right? The slope of the voltage across it. And that turns out to be very, very important. So it's not V is equal to IR, although it turns out we can use a form of Ohm's law as long as certain requirements are met in the circuit, which we'll explain momentarily. All right, so utilizing a source over here that should be a sine wave, that's what we're going to start off with, one kilohertz, one volt peak, that's our default, all right? If you use the capacitive reactance formula, 1 over 2 pi uh, F times C, the X sub C works out to 1 K ohm at 1 kilohertz, all right? Minus J 1 K ohm at 1 kilohertz. It's actually a little bit off that, 100 and, it's actually 159 points something, but I just use 158 because it plots nice. All right, so let's just run up here and do a transient analysis. Now remember, when we were looking at the resistor, the current sort of followed whatever the voltage was doing. We changed frequency, we changed amplitude, we even changed wave shape. And whatever we got out of the, um, the voltage source, that's, in other words, the voltage that was appearing across the resistance, we got the same kind of thing, just scaled, right, by the, by the component value. Um, we got the same kind of thing as far as the current was concerned. Let's see what happens here with our capacitor. All right, once again, the current's going to be really tiny, so I'm going to uh, separate the curves out so we can see them. All right, so on top is the current for, through the cap, and on the bottom is the voltage across the cap. So here's the one volt sine wave that we expect to see, and we also see a sine, or at least a sinusoid, at one milliamp, right? One volt divided by one K would give us one milliamp. But interestingly, these are not perfectly in sync. In fact, the top curve, the green curve, which is the current, is a cosine wave instead of a sine wave. Right? This is at positive peak when this sine wave is at zero, right? as it's going positively. Right? So here's another spot, and you can see the positive peak. And um, you know, when it's going negatively at zero, we see a negative peak. And when it's at peak, basically you're going to see um, zero for that current. So it is a sinusoid, right? But technically it's a cosine. It's off by 90 degrees. This is leading the voltage by 90 degrees, right? Current leads voltage by 90 degrees, by a quarter cycle. Well, that's definitely a difference, right? That's definitely not the same thing that we saw with the resistor. They were perfectly in sync with the resistor. So if I went to uh, try to do an XY plot, what would I get out of this? So I'll do the post-processor, all right? And we're gonna do an XY plot over here. So on the horizontal, I'll put the capacitor voltage. And on the vertical, we'll put on the current. All right, we'll maybe give this a name like uh, VI. Create that. So remember, we had a straight line, and the slope of that straight line for the resistor uh, indicated what the resistance was, right? Actually, the, the slope was uh, uh, indicating the conductance, but the conductance is just the reciprocal. 
of the resistance. Okay, so let's see what we get here for our capacitor. Uh, definitely not a straight line. Um, initially, this looks like a, an ellipse, but that's only because we don't have this equally spaced out. So I just moved this in. So here's one unit, right? Uh, one milliamp versus one volt. I'm just trying to make these grids square. And what you can see is we're getting a circle, right? We're not getting a line. Um, you know, as the voltage starts at zero, the current's already at a maximum. So as the voltage goes sweeping up, the current comes down. And then, right, we get this kind of arc. Then as the voltage comes back to zero, the current goes the other way. And then we continue around the horn, so to speak, right? So looking at the transient, so here's the voltage going up to peak. The current starts at the peak and goes to zero. Then as the voltage comes back down to zero, we see the current swinging negative, right, to its peak. And then it continues. So I get a circle out of this. Well, that's considerably different than what we saw with um, our resistor. All right. All right. Let us get rid of this because I don't want to keep plotting this over and over and over and over again. All right. And now we're going to go in and change a few other things, right? So another parameter we can change would be the frequency of the sine wave, right? Or we could change the amplitude of the sine wave. Um, you know, we could just maybe change the amplitude immediately, and then we'll come back, we'll do the frequency, right? So now I've got twice the voltage. So what would that do? I should get twice the current. At least that's what happened in the resistance, right? X sub C shouldn't change. I haven't changed the frequency. I've just changed the amplitude. So I should still have minus J1K here. And with 2 volts and minus, J1, minus J1K, that would imply that we should get 2 milliamps. So let's see what we get. All right, and once again, I am going to separate out the curve. So here's our current on top. And sure enough, 2 milliamps. All right, so that looks good it looks like we have the same phase relationship right there's this is the original one with one milliamp and here's the new one with two milliamps so all right we still have that we would still get if we did the plot we would still get a circle it would just have a different scale on it but it would still be a circle it wouldn't you know turn into some weird shape wouldn't turn into a parabola or something like that okay so let's go back and change the other parameter here so i'm going to Turn that voltage peak back to 1, and then we will alter the frequency to 2 kilohertz. So I'm going to double the frequency. Now remember, when we did this with the resistor, all that really happened is we had twice as many cycles here. All right? We got the same peak value and so on and so forth. Um, that's not really what we're going to see here. We don't expect that to happen, because by changing the frequency, we're going to change x sub c. x sub c is equal to 1 over 2 pi times f times c. So if I double f, leaving c the same, if I double f, x sub c gets cut in half. And consequently, with the same voltage, I would expect to see an increase in the current. If I'm going to do that by a factor of 2, I'd expect that current to go up by a factor of 2. Let's check it out. OK. Separate out the curves. All right, so we do see a doubling of the cycles, as would be expected. It still appears that we're getting the same phase. This is a sine, and this is a, a positive cosine. Um, look, 2 mils, right? I didn't change the amplitude. This, that was still a 1 volt peak. But the current has gone up, because as we increase the frequency, we impact the value of x sub c, right? Resistor is consistent. It doesn't matter what the frequency is. You got a 1k resistor, could be 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, a megahertz, it's 1k ohm. That's the end of it. With a capacitor, it's the capacitance that stays constant, right? If it's 158 nanofarads, it's 158 nanofarads, no matter what the frequency is. But the x sub c is a function of capacitance and frequency. So the X sub C changes. And you could think of X sub C as, you know, sort of the, you know, we call it reactance because it's, it's a measure of how the um, 
current reacts to the voltage, you know, versus how the current is resisted, right? The resistance part, we talk about a current voltage and how is that current flow resisted? That's where the word comes from. So here we, we can't use the same quite, quite the same word. So we say, this is how it reacts. So we call it reactance, but that is a function of frequency. So we do see a change in the amplitude, okay? Not the same. All right, let's go back, change something else. So we've changed the amplitude, we've changed the frequency. What else could we change, right? This is what we started with, one volt and one kilohertz. What else can we change? Well, what about the wave shape, right? When we did this with a uh, resistor, we found that um, a triangle wave, right? If I chose a triangle wave, Triangle wave in, triangle wave out, as far as the voltage versus the current. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I'm gonna grab that, and I'm gonna get the same amplitude and frequency. Again, I wanna keep things as consistent as possible. So it's still one volt peak, still uh, one kilohertz. Okay, so no change there. But you know, I said at the outset that the current is equal to capacitance times the rate of change of voltage with respect to time. If I change the shape, Maybe I'm changing dv dt. Hmm. Let's check out the transient response. Okay. Separate the curves. What? All right, we got like some kind of square wave here for the triangle. This is clearly not the same shape. Uh, this little pointy bit over here is really um, due to some effects of the simulation. You could actually suppress those if you wanted to. Um, if you came into the options here and you changed the transient uh, integration method over here, um, you could actually make them worse, but you could round this off and get a nice ideal square wave. I don't want to monkey with it. Um, this is sufficient enough. In a real world circuit, one of the reasons I left this here is because in a real world circuit, you probably would get some ringing. You would get some overshoot and maybe a little undershoot here. You get a little ring, so to speak, a little like mini sine wave in there damped out. That's fairly typical in, in uh, you know, RC circuits and RL circuits. So um, what the heck, leave it in. Just understand that this is basically a square wave. And here's the way it works. Here's a nice straight piece of the input. So what is the rate of change, right? dv dt here is constant. It's not changing. It is, you know, some volts per unit time. There is some number associated with that, all right? So the current would be constant because this slope is constant. It's a constant angle. That's a way of looking at it. So the value for the current would be constant, and there it is, it's constant, all right? So these things line up to those peaks. So when it's negative going, what do I get? I get a constant negative value. If I change the slope, I basically change the amplitudes of that square. But I put a triangle wave in and I get a square wave out. It changes the shape. That certainly did not happen when we dealt with resistors. We always got the same shape, current and voltage. Not true here, all right? And this is an important thing to remember. You know, we very often in AC circuits, we do what's called single frequency sinusoidal analysis. We just look at sources that are just always sine waves, one frequency. We might use multiple frequencies if we're doing maybe a superposition kind of thing. We wanna see what the individual components are, but you will notice that we don't use things like triangle waves or square waves or some other kind of shape, non-sinusoidal shape, when we analyze these. Right? We might use different phase shifts for sine waves, but we would not use different shapes right? because of the way in which the capacitor behaves. It literally changes the shape. Another thing you can remember here is that anything other than a sine wave, a triangle wave, a square wave, some kind of rectangular pulse, whatever the heck it is, a speech waveform, if it's not a simple sine wave, it can be decomposed using Fourier series into a whole bunch of sine waves. So what you're really saying here is this capacitor, by altering the shape of the wave in time, right, going from a triangle to a square, it's actually changing the frequency uh, spectrum that comprises that signal. 
It could be removing frequency components. It could be adding frequency components. It could be changing their relative amplitudes and their phases. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what's happening here. The, the amplitudes and phases of the frequency components are altered. Okay, that's kind of, kind of an interesting and probably important thing. As a matter of fact, that idea is what hinges behind uh, the construction of what are called filter circuits something that we would look at in a semiconductor course, an electronics course, or a telecommunications course. All right, not to belabor the point, let's get back to our original sine wave. All right, so we started off with um, at one volt and one kilohertz, get that back to normal. So the next thing to do, or the last thing to do actually, is to um, look at the value of the capacitance itself. So let's double this. All right, so when we when we changed, all right, that would be uh, 316 nano. When we changed this same kind of thing in uh, the resistor, you know, what wound up happening is bigger resistance, same voltage, you got less current, right? So you double the resistance and you have the current. What happens here? Well, you change the capacitance, you're definitely going to change the reactance, but again, it's a reciprocal. It's 1 over 2 pi Fc, all right? So C is doubled, which means the capacitive reactance is halved. So that should make the current double, all right? Definitely something a little bit different. Let's do a transient analysis. Separate the curves, and there you go, right? We still have the cosine-sine relation, but here it is. 2 milliamps rather than 1 milliamp like it was with the original value. And if you really wanted to, you know, we could come back in here just to sort of be complete about it, right? We could remake our XY plot. I won't go through all of the details. But I could just remake, um, remake this. And we're still going to get a circle, right? All that's happened is the scaling is different. Right? But once you set this up for, like I said, square grid, uh, you get a circle. So really, it's just the size of the circle, the radius of the circle, that changes. All right. All right. So that winds up being, in some respects, the same as a resistor. You know, if we have that single sine wave coming in, we still see a scaling. Bigger the input is, voltage, the larger the current will be in stop. You know, kind of like follows Ohm's law in that regard, right? You double up the voltage, you double up the current. However, we do see that the uh, shape, at least if it's a sine wave, is shifted in time by a quarter of a cycle. We see a 90 degree shift. And if it's a non-sinusoid, we can actually drastically alter the shape of that waveform. All right. Frequency also affects the amplitude. It doesn't just change the repetition rate, the cycles, like it does in a resistor. It, in, in fact, also changes the amplitude of that current because X sub C, right, the ohmic value, that's another way of th thinking about it, changes in accordance with frequency. And that doesn't happen with a resistor. Like I said, a resistor, if it's a 1K, it doesn't matter if it's 100 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, it's still a 1K. But X sub C does change with the capacitance. All right? Great. So that covers pretty much everything. Now... Take a little break. We'll come back for part three, dealing with inductors. See you then.